Good morning and Happy New Year. It's 2021 years, more or less, since Jesus first appeared among us and that is worth celebrating at any time of year, at the beginning, in the middle and the end. Anyone who has a genuine knowledge of God, Dallas Willard says, for those people, for us, praise is the only appropriate attitude in which to live. It is, he says, the only sane attitude. So what better way to start off our time together this morning as we meet in our homes across our parish and our town and our world? What better way than worshipping God, praising him and thanking him? It's the best way to live in the knowledge, in the light of the knowledge of God. So let's celebrate the light come among us and worship God together wherever we are and in whatever circumstances and frame of mind we find ourselves today. Let's praise and let's worship.
Today's reading comes from the first letter of Peter and it's chapter 1 and I hope you've downloaded the reading and this worksheet of the reading. Um, as the talk proceeds you can fill in some of those keywords. You can see the keywords along the bottom. You can fill them in as they come up. You may be able to think of other words of course as um, the talk goes on and as you think about this passage please feel free to fill in your own words and discuss this with others. My hope is that as we take on board just the glorious truths of this passage we'll be encouraged and inspired even in this very difficult time. So here with the reading is Gav and after that we'll launch straight into the talk. Please make notes and pray into this um, as we go along and afterwards too. Thanks Gav. Today's reading is taken from 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 to 25. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ. A lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures for ever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Just about every year at this time, people talk about New Year's resolutions. I haven't heard quite as much this year about resolutions. Maybe because everyone really knows what a big battle we have on our hands with the COVID pandemic, as well as all the regular troubles that we have. Good intentions are always more evident at the start of the year, nevertheless. I've seen a few more people out running than I usually do. And I think, well, resolutions can be helpful, but I need something much more. Good intentions for me aren't enough. A couple of weeks extra in the gym never works for me. 
just trying harder doesn't really cut it for me any longer. What I need, instead of resolutions, are revolutions. And the revolutions we need, and which I think are worth taking a look at at the start of the year, happen when God breaks into our lives through Jesus. We haven't got long. I'm going to try and zap through 15 different things, I think, emerge uh, to help us understand the revolutions God has for us in that amazing reading from 1 Peter chapter 1. If you've printed out the sheet with the reading on and the little gaps you can fill in as we go along with some of the words, please do that just to help you come to grips with some of the concepts and ideas in this passage. I'm sure there are lots of other words that you could put in and you're welcome to put in your own words and comments as we go along. But I'm going to highlight 15 words I can get from this passage, which I think help us to begin to realise some of the revolutions that we have in our lives readily available from God right here and now, right in the midst of this lockdown in the light of the pandemic we're going through. So let's get going. Number one, we have new life in God, a whole kind of new life. We're, we're born again, it says. We're given new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Being born is one of the most significant and um, important things that ever happens to us, of course. We don't fully understand what happens, but it does mark us for good or not so good, depending on how it happens. In Jesus, raised from the dead, there is a whole new kind of life available to us. Now, quite often when you hear about this new life or being born again, in the newspapers, in the press, talking about someone being born again can just be newspaper code for this person is crazy. But we know that something much more profound is going on. In John chapter 3, we hear Jesus talking about it, being born from above, a spiritual awakening, which really does get into us and start a whole kind of revolution going on inside of us. That's the new life that we have. That's the new birth. That's the birth from above. The Bible says it's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead at work in us, in our mortal bodies. We can have that. That's an astonishing thing. When we start to receive it, we realise a revolution is underway within us. That's the first thing from 1 Peter chapter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's given us new birth through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Next up, number two. We're into verse four here. We have a new inheritance. And whenever that word inheritance comes up in normal circumstances, shall we say, in, in this life, um, we start thinking about wills and who's going to get what. Have I been cut out of the will? Has someone else been more favoured than me? Will there be anything left for me? Is it all going to Birmingham Dogs Home instead? This, however, is a different kind of inheritance. The inheritance we get from Jesus is an inheritance that's imperishable, it's undefiled, it's unfading, it can't perish or spoil or fade because it's a heavenly spiritual inheritance that we have. It's all the more secure for that. The inheritance of the rescue we have from God, the new life we have in God, is, is not like the inheritance we get from a relative or we keep in the Bank of England. It's more like the Bank of Heaven. It's not cash under the mattress. It's God's everlasting love. It's available to us. A new inheritance. That's the second of our New Year revolutions from 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 5 talks about being shielded by God's power. As we trust in God, we realise that we are shielded by God's power until the coming of the rescue that is going to be revealed before too long. This is really important. There are so many anxieties around, so much uncertainty um, in the light of the pandemic and the, the loss of loved ones and the worry about what's going to happen to us. We have this security given to us 
And when we look at the events in Washington, D.C. this past week, where a U.S. president who really should have known better eggs on protesters who were destructive and seemed to threaten some of the foundations we have for a free and just society. There's, there are so many reasons in worldly terms why we are anxious. That's why it's really important that we realise there is a revolution from God available to us right now. We have security. We are shielded. We're asked to shield, some of us, in this pandemic to protect ourselves. Actually, all of us are shielded and protected by God's love right here and now and in whatever comes when we move from this life to the next one. We are, through our faith and confidence in God, shielded by his power until the rescue comes. Another word for it, you might know it, of course, shepherd. We have a good shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd of Psalm 23. In him we have security and safety now and always. What's up next? New joy. Once we realise that we have a, a revolutionary start at work within us, once we realise that we're secure and loved now and always, once the reality of that begins to work in our souls, then increasingly we begin to trade our anxiety and our worry and our faults and failings, our sin and our shame. We trade those in for God's good stuff. And one of the great things we have is joy. Joy is just that sense of well-being which can permeate all of our lives. It begins to replace depression and anger and sadness as we trust God and grow in the reality of knowing him and living with him and working with him. It's not like momentary intense pleasure. A lot of us seek out intense hits of pleasure one way or another. And of course, afterwards it all deflates and it's, you know, it, it doesn't last. What we're talking about here is, in the words of an old hymn, solid joy and lasting treasure. And it's there even when life gets tough. Would you normally expect to see these two words in one sentence? It talks about rejoicing. In this you greatly rejoice, even though for a little while you may have had to suffer, suffer grief in all kinds of different ways. Joy and suffering don't normally go together. But in the kingdom of God, in the revolutionary kingdom of God available to us, we can learn slowly but surely that the two can and do go together and that we can fall back in our sense of contentment and joy even when everything else seems to be falling apart around us. That's the greatness and goodness of God. We have joy in the midst of all our troubles. Next up, verse 7, wealth. What is true wealth? Is it selling your house for a profit? Is it winning the lottery, getting something on a scratch card? Well, no. Wealth can come and go. Over the past few years, over the past decade or so, we've seen all kinds of challenges to the wealth and the institutions which rely on worldly wealth. Look at what happened after the, the Brexit referendum, the pound fell. Look at the financial crash of a decade or more ago and the implications which us in some ways are still with us. Look at all the reaction and worry about the COVID crisis and the pandemic. Now, money and housing are, of course, important parts of life. But the bigger and better reality is of the God who provides everything we need. And this verse says it. Your faith, that is your trust, that is your confidence in God, is much more precious than money or possessions. It's of greater wealth than gold. We have trials so that the proven genuineness of our faith, which is of greater worth than gold, gold perishes even when refined through fire, our faith, our confidence, our trust in God will result in praise and glory and honour when Jesus is revealed. We have new wealth in these revolutions that God brings us. Next up, new trust. So many of us look for happiness endlessly in another person. 
we look for the perfect match and quite often we're let down over and over again even with the people we trust and know the best we're all fallible we all make mistakes we all go wrong and we all are let down one way or another the perfection we're really looking for first and foremost comes from God that's tr tough because uh, though we haven't seen him we have to learn to love him and even though we don't see him we, we do grow in trust and confidence in him and as we've heard that fills us with inexpressible and glorious joy a continuous all-pervading sense of well-being God is the one to trust first and foremost as we get that sense of confidence in God that frees us from over-reliance on people around us because God loves us, because he provides everything for us. We don't have to put as much pressure on other people to come through for us in quite the same way. We know we can trust and rely on God and that sets us free to love other people and be loved as best as we can love each other. Belief, trust, confidence in God, that's what we have another of our new year revolutions we also have a new future i mentioned last time i spoke to you of a, a friend that i lost um, who took his own life as a result of the the pandemic that we're in and what other ever whatever other pressures he was under actually we ha do have a future he had lost confidence in a in a, in a in a future that he could see we do have a future in this life and the next we are receiving the end result of our confidence and trust in God which is the the rescue the salvation of our souls salvation is one of those religious words that we hear maybe use the word rescue or maybe use the word deliverance instead of salvation if salvation is just a religious word to you this life is not all that there is there is good in this life and there is more to come in the next life there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth where Jesus reigns and rules in all the loving ways that most of us really really long for people will be delighted when Jesus comes to reign and the new future fully begins it starts now as we put our trust in Jesus he gets us access to his kingdom he wants us to be part of it we have a future with him maybe this is one of the words where the word revolution really is relevant when we look at worldly revolutions and failed attempts at revolutions things always seem to well sometimes they get better with a revolution but quite often a different bunch of broken people get in charge and things end up falling apart again in God and in God's kingdom the revolution is a good one which will endure forever that is the promise that is the future that we have in God and we have a new understanding in our lives of what it all means and what it's all about that's a question that often happens of course when we look at the night sky and or look at a sunset sometimes we get to thinking well what's it all about there must be more to, to life than what's going on around us and when we're in the midst of tough times too we're looking for explanations there must be meaning to it all there must be something behind it all and the bible of is full of the people it talks about trying to get to grips with what god is doing in our broken and messed up world and the prophets searched and inquired for understanding and that's what this passage verse 10 says the prophets spoke of the grace that was to come they were and searching intently um, with great care trying to find out um, when the Messiah the when the rescuer was gonna come and they didn't get to see what we have seen and can see which is the glory and wonder of Jesus revealed to us that's what Christmas and Epiphany time Epiphany means revelation of God we can see what God is like in Jesus and that gives us an understanding Jesus's birth his life his miracles his teaching his death his resurrection his ascension all this gives us new understanding in the midst of life and all its troubles and difficulties that's a wonderful thing it is good news and it is revolutionary 
That leads on, the word therefore in verse 13. Therefore, in view of everything, all these things that we have already talked about, these new revolutions that we have, therefore, says Peter, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. The outworking of all these new things, these revolutions, is a completely new way of looking at the world, understanding it. We have a new worldview. A worldview is basically the set of assumptions we work on in accordance with what we think is true and right and real. What we think is real determines how we behave and act and react in our lives. Quite often in the world around us we're basing on our, our reactions and our worldview on false assumptions or inadequate assumptions. The full revelation of God has been made to us in Jesus. Everything he so, says and does works when we put it into action. The way of understanding the world is the way that Jesus saw it. He was the greatest human being ever to exist, the wisest, the best, the most loving. His understanding, his way of seeing the world can be our way of seeing the world too. And Peter, Peter invites us to set our hope fully on the grace that comes to us at the revelation of Jesus. God exists. He loves us. There's meaning and purpose for us. He's putting things right and we can be in on it right here and now, no matter what the circumstances are that we're caught up in. We have a new worldview because of Jesus and his love for us. Now, as we begin to put into action what Jesus said, when we get to grips with his way of understanding the world and put into action, do what he says, then a new lifestyle emerges. As we follow Jesus, the way we want to do life will change. The way we choose to do life changes. Sometimes people say, oh, I've started to feel more guilty since I've begun to follow Jesus than I did before. Actually, that is usually a very good sign because it means we know we can no longer rely on the things that we did in the past. God is putting us right and in him there is no condemnation anymore. We just work with him to change the way we live, to change our lifestyle. We're called to be holy and to become holy with his help. We need his help. We can't do it without him. Be holy, it says, Peter says to us, because God is holy. Now, holiness isn't just being goody-goody and nicey-nicey and holier than thou and looking down on other people for not keeping the rules the way that we do in our perfection. Holiness is much bigger and better than that. Holiness is more to do with wholeness, with goodness, with completeness, um, being and becoming everything God meant, meant us to be, being fully alive, living healthy, good lives as God empowers us sometimes even in the midst of the trouble and difficulties that we have. And that's what holiness is. That's where our lifestyle changes. We become the men and the women God means us to be and helps us to be by his grace as we choose to take up what he gives us and follow him. A new lifestyle will emerge as we follow Jesus and put into practice what he says. That new lifestyle is available. We're here to help each other with it and to follow it. The more we go on this journey of doing life with God, the more we realize it's not just made up stuff, it's not just religious stuff, it's not just a little extra on our lives. As we begin to realize that we have a whole new way, a worldview, a whole new way of understanding life, the universe and everything, as we grow into that, our understanding of God changes. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Perhaps at one time we just ignored God. Perhaps we mocked the idea of God and mocked those who believed in him. Perhaps we slandered him, blamed him for stuff that the enemy or that human beings have done. When we start to get to know him for ourselves and just how good and great he is, that changes the way we see God and see ourselves and see other people. A new respect for God begins to grow in us. 
and it will extend to ourselves and other people as well. Experience of God leads to knowledge of God. We know it's true that God loves us and forgives us and heals us. And the more knowledge we have, the more our respect for who God really is and everything he's doing grows as well. It quite often feels like we're exiled in a, in a strange country. So many things go wrong around us. We long for things to be better. But the truth is we have this new home waiting for us. We can start getting ready for it now. We can begin to live in it, some of it right now, growing in God, growing in our respect for God and each other as well. We have new respect through everything that God does for us. That's another of our New Year revolutions. As we begin to see how great God is and how needy we are and how much we need him to be in our lives, for our lives to work, that brings with it a certain amount of humility. You know that it was not with perishable things like silver and gold that we were redeemed from the empty way of life that we had been living, handed down to us. Rather, it was with the precious blood of Jesus that it came to us. Jesus is the Lamb of God without blemish. When people are kidnapped, quite often a ransom has to be paid. And maybe governments or rich family members can pay it. Um, if we're rich, we can sort out the money. It's not like that with God's life and God's kingdom and God's rescue for us. The debts are too high. We can't do it in our own strength or rely on somebody else to do it for us. Actually, Jesus, the Lamb of God, is the one we need. And that realisation, that resignation, that giving in to him, that letting him come in and work these revolutions in our lives, that brings humility and requires humility. We don't pretend anymore. We don't push anymore. We look to Jesus to help us to work in us that which we can't work in ourselves. We need him to rescue us out of it. Once we know what God is up to, once it hits our hearts in our situation, it does make us very humble indeed. And with that humility comes liberation. No more false pretending is required. We can just trust God to lift us up and out and grow in him and with him. All this gives us a new focus. Where does your attention wander when, you do, when it does wander? All the cares and concerns, the news feed, the Netflix feed, the computer games feed. Where do we go? Where is our focus in life? We're meant to enjoy all the good things that God gives us in the right ways, but we need to keep our focus on God himself, our faith and hope are in God. He's the source of everything else that's good. Putting him first means we see everything else in its right context. People and possessions and passions don't save us or get us out of trouble. God is the one that gets us out. He's the anchor that keeps us still in the, in the storm. He is the foundation that we can build things on which are really worth building. Loving God first, not the created things is the way to live life. When we love the Creator first, all the created things fall into the right place. We have a revolutionary new focus on God through all that Jesus has done. We have new love. God is love and love is a word that is bandied around quite a lot and quite often it just seems to mean anything people want. Whatever I want, if I get it, that is, that is love, and it may not always be good for us. God is love, and love is wanting the best for ourselves and other people. God shows us all about it. He knows what's truly best. He helps us live that kind of life to receive the kind of love we need and to extend it to others. We have trouble and difficulty quite often coming to terms with what love really is, and we find out the hard way quite often what love really isn't. St. Augustine, writing 14 or 15 centuries ago, asked God, pray to God, set love in order in me. All the confused and broken ways we love 
can be revolutionised by getting in on God's kind of love, the true love, the best love, the deepest love, the most revolutionary and powerful love. Let's that, that be our prayer today. Set love in order in me today, Lord. And thank you that this new revolutionary love is available. As we work in this, we find new confidence. As we trust God, we learn where we can trust ourselves and other people as well. And this is true even as, frankly, we come and go in this life. I quite often read these words at funeral services, at gravesides. All people are like grass. Their glory is like the flower of a field and the grass withers and the flowers fail, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Sometimes people are devastated by the loss of other people. Sometimes people are so worried about dying themselves. This message of good news, revolutionary good news we have from Jesus, gives us new confidence in our lives. We can trust God. We can look to God with faith and trust and belief and hope. Because whatever else happens to us, whatever else happens to the world around us, God doesn't change. His word stands true. His promises are true now and forever. We have new confidence in God. So all of this, I've gone on a bit, haven't I, saying 15 things. Here they are. This is the good news preached to us. We have all these things right now, this new year. We have them right now in the pandemic. Whatever's happened to us, whatever's happening to our loved one, whatever is going to go on in this difficult new year, all these things, these revolutionary things are what we have. Life, inheritance, security, joy, wealth, trust, a future, understanding, a new way of looking at the world, a worldview, a new lifestyle, new respect, new humility and focus and love and confidence. We get all these as we look at Jesus and start to follow him and trust him and do what he says. So, Lord Jesus, my prayer at the start of this difficult new year is that you will speak these revolutions into our hearts and minds. That as we choose to trust you and follow you and do what you say this year in our lives, that we will grow in our knowledge of you. That we will know more profoundly than ever before the revolution that is underway in the universe and the revolution that is underway with us personally as well. Speak to our hearts, Lord Jesus. Give us grace to follow you. And may we grow and become all that you want us to be. Give us joy in the midst of these trials. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. I raise a hallelujah In the presence of my enemies I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah
really important as friends, as followers of Jesus, to meet with him, spend time with him deliberately in his presence. So we're going to do that again now. You might have some bread and wine ready just to reenact the Last Supper as Jesus asked us to. As we get ready to do that, let's just come to him and confess anything that's in the way, perhaps, of our relationship with him. Jesus said to us that we should pray, forgive us our sins. So if there's anything on your conscience, or if the Holy Spirit is just putting his finger specifically on something that might have gone wrong, then just come to him, come to Jesus with some prayers of confession. He's more ready and willing to forgive us than we are to confess. So you come without condemnation and in expectation that you will be restored. Lord, forgive us our sins. Jesus also asks us to forgive those who sin against us. When we do that, we stand a better chance of being on good terms with people around us, at least insofar as it depends on us. But also, we can be released from the effects of the sins of others against us. We can be freed from bitterness and from misunderstanding about who we truly are. So, Let's forgive those who've sinned against us as well. It might be little things that have happened recently. It might be bigger things. It might be bigger things that have happened a long time ago, which need a lot of re-forgiving. Let's just come and forgive those who sin against us with Jesus' help and see all that sin taken away by Jesus on the cross. When we come honestly and openly to Jesus like this, it's so important that we take hold of the reality of what Jesus has done for us. We need to receive our forgiveness. And where we've been hurt by ourselves or others, we need to let him restore our souls and heal us. According to his great mercy, God's great mercy. God has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So receive now your forgiveness. Jesus says you are forgiven. Receive your healing. You are raised to life with Jesus, born again to a living hope through his resurrection. Just in a moment of quiet, take hold of that reality. The great symbols of the forgiveness and healing we receive are the bread and the wine, Jesus' body and blood. Jesus died on the cross to take it all away and Jesus rose from the dead to raise us with him to new life. So we're going to do as he asked now and remember that last supper and what he said about the bread and wine and what it means. 
St. Paul writes, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Remember, Jesus loves you and we love you too. Praying is easier when our hearts are full of worship and praise and adoration and thanksgiving. So perhaps this is a good moment to bring our heartfelt prayers to God, knowing that he loves us and wants to guide us in our prayers and answer our prayers. Our prayers can change things, so let's pray together now. First, let's pray for the church. Let's pray for each other, the church of St. Peter here in Walsall. And let's pray for the church throughout Walsall, throughout the UK, and right around the world. May the message we've thought about today, the revolutionary kingdom that we're part of, May we live out the good news powerfully and lovingly. We're in the midst of a, a real crisis, a crisis bigger than most of us have known in our lifetimes. So let's pray for everyone at work in the NHS and in all the other key support services. You might be able to think of people who do important but unrecognised jobs. I was speaking to some grave diggers this week. Their job is vital, but they don't feel fully recognised. Let's pray that everyone who does those less recognised jobs will know the value of their work and feel appreciated. And finally, let's pray for wise and godly leaders who can handle this pandemic and who can lead our nations in the ways of justice and love and peace. Let's pray for our own country, for the USA especially, at this time of transition and right around the world. Let's bring our prayers close to home now. And just think of those people that we live alongside, our neighbours and our friends. Let's pray for their welfare and well-being. Ask for God's blessing to come to them, their king, God's kingdom to be open to them. Let's pray for schools and colleges trying to cope with online learning and, and with some, some kids in school. Let's pray for our council as well, um, who have all kinds of difficult jobs to do at this time. Let's pray for our councillors and our council officials and workers. Let's pray for God to bless our local community. So many people have been taken by this, this virus and have been taken ill with the virus and some of course have, have died from it. Let's pray for everyone who is ill with COVID right now. Let's pray for healing. And of course, many other things go wrong with our physical and mental health. Let's pray for everyone who's afflicted in body, mind or spirit in any way. And let's also pray for those who've lost loved ones through COVID or any other means. And as we do that, let's remember especially the friends of those we know who've passed away recently. Uh, Eva Mansell, Brian Revel, Kathleen Grocutt and Annie Stone.
Finally, let's take encouragement from the lives of so many people who've been through so many things and are now at rest with God. We can take courage from the testimony and the stories of, of so many different people. You might bring to mind one or two now. You might remember some people that you know. We can also look back with gratitude on those who've gone before us into God's presence and just quietly be thankful for them. And of course, we can be thankful that we have a secure future in this life and the next. There is an inheritance waiting for us that cannot perish or fade. Let's take hold of that again now and may it help us to trust God in all our trials and troubles right now. Bring to God your own prayers, even as you trust him for this life and forever. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for praying. Please keep praying on these and other matters in the weeks and months ahead. One more thing you can pray about is the PCC, the, the elected body that looks after the running of the church. Uh, the PCC meets again tomorrow night, Monday night, and there are a couple of important things amongst all the, the, the regular business we have to consider, which includes our response as a church to COVID lockdown again, and also the next steps to get the heating and seating sorted in our building. We're on the verge of being able to do that, but we need some prayer uh, and some godly intervention to help bring that about. Please pray into all that. And please um, let's stick together as a church let's unite in all the different ways that we can thank god for the telephone and the internet thank god for our zoom groups um, please make the most of those if you're not in a in, in a group uh, you're not in a some sort of bubble arrangement with somebody um, please let us know and we can try and and help um, get you into something which will help in the in the support that we all need right now and let's pray that um, as we receive the love and the, the strength that we need from God, that we'll be able in turn to reach out to our community in loving and appropriate safe ways at this difficult time. May we be part of God's solution uh, to the, uh, the tragedy and difficulty of the, of the COVID situation. Please pray into that and let's support each other as we reach out appropriately as well. Um, I'm going to end now with a prayer of blessing and after that we'll sing a church favourite song about Jesus the Good Shepherd. I encourage you to sing that song wholeheartedly because it is true. We have the Good Shepherd whose goodness doesn't fail and he's always with us. Um, that's what we're all about and so sing it wholeheartedly and thank you for uh, being part of our worship and our church life today. Please receive the blessing of God as we close. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you are great and good and true and just and kind and loving. Thank you that you are always with us. Help us, Lord, to receive in our hearts, to choose to overrule and override the negativity, the lies, the doubts, the fears, the anxieties in order to receive you into our hearts. Bring your love, send your Holy Spirit guide us and bless us keep us safe keep your angels guarding us and our homes and our community lord thank you for your goodwill to us that's the blessing of god almighty father son and holy spirit he is with us now and will be forever amen My shepherd is whose goodness faileth never. I'm nothing like if I am his, and he is mine forever, and he is mine forever.